Um, I would like to speak out a very warm welcome to everyone coming here. Thank you so much for being here and um, joining us to the conference Black Mountain Educational Turn in the Avant-Garde here at Hamburger Bahnhof, Museum für Gegenwart. I'm Annalena Werner, I'm a PhD student at Freie Universität Berlin and was involved in the Black Mountain research, uh, research project for the last two and a half years. Um, and I would like to speak from a student's perspective uh, and perhaps giving a voice to the many students that have actively participated in this research project here and also for our blog, blackmountainresearch.com. Um, I would like to thank the team of Hamburger Bahnhof, uh, specifically Gabriele Knappstein, Matilda Felix and Eugen Blume. Also, of course, Arnold Dreiblatt for his project performing the Black Mountain Archive. Um, I would like to thank them for their efforts uh, for making this project happen and to give us an insight into exhibition making, allowing us to partake in an active learning experience of, in and at the museum. I would also like to thank Anetia E. Lehmann for putting an enormous amount of idealism and elaborate ideas into this project and also for encouraging us with her trust in us, always. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank Verena um, Kittel, who has been pulling all the strings in the back. Um, and she is an amazing colleague and a fantastic researcher. I would also like to thank Katja Heinrich, Olga Bull, Jens Krauser, and Marius Legowski for helping us tonight uh, with all their efforts. For many of us, the working with a subject such as Black Mountain has evoked idealist and radical thoughts, as for example, interdisciplinarity and collaboration, while at the same time it has confronted us with the difficulty of integrating these ideas into our current existing structures in education and art. It also made us question established up and coming concepts, such as the debate about artistic research or the production of knowledge. The upcoming program mirrors this ambiguity, and it seems to me as if most of us would like to, but cannot uncritically, believe in a revival of what we imagine Black Mountain to have been. One of these critical thinkers is our keynote speaker, the American art historian and writer James Elkins, who I'm very happy to introduce to you now. Elkins, who once began his career as a, as a painter, a very, very long time ago, as I heard, <laughs> Um, is uh, now a professor in the Department of Art History, uh, Theory and Criticism at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Having edited and written several art books such as What Painting Is, Art Critiques, A Guide, and recently What Photography Is. Uh, as of this autumn, however, James Elkins will stop art historical writing and instead begin an experimental novel with the working title The Journey. According to him, one of the reasons to, now I quote him, uh, leave art history is because I would like to see how well I might be able to write when I'm no longer concerned about disciplinary expectations or constraints. Quote end. James Elkins is interested in what he calls the articulation of seeing, but he's also interested in science and literary practices transferred into art historical realms. In previous essays and lectures, he discussed the balance between concepts, words, and images and how these concepts are limiting and disciplines demarcate areas of research and practice from each other. Interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity, however, are discussable terms for him as well. Likewise, in today's lecture, James Elkins will pose the question, what is research? He looks at the terms historical and current notions and questions his concept both in the arts and generally in academia revealing methodologies and knowledge production as a repetitive condition of academic research, Elkins takes a critical and, as he told me before, very pessimistic uh, position by suggesting to abandon the established concept of research and proposing not to take it as a given or to use it uncritically. Before finally handing the microphone over to James Elkins, I will ask Yael Lehmann up here to close a prearranged deal that involves a very special gift for our keynote speaker. So, put it up for them.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was sort of hoping to have those at a restaurant, but I'll have them afterwards. Okay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Well, um, so I, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, but I think that my function here is, um, is probably to be the, the, the pessimistic beginning of the conference. And I think the conference will become more optimistic as we go along, and when we get to Erie, I think it will be more, more, um, more topical and more optimistic. The reason I say pessimistic is because I, I follow the literature of the practice-based PhD, and that's what I'm going to report on tonight how the practice-based PhD in different countries imagines research and how it imagines knowledge. I, I, feel my, uh, I feel that if the founders of the Black Mountain College could come back miraculously and see this exhibition, and I think they'd be weeping <laughs> because the amount of, of uh, bureaucracy and administration now and the quantification of bureaucracy is so much beyond what, was, what it was in the 1930s, they would be, um, they'd be in despair. <laughs> so. Maybe it's better they're not here. So I have a four parts to this talk. Uh, first of all, I'm going to say a little bit about a very simple point, the size of the literature, how much writing there is on this subject. And most of my talk has to do with um, uh, research, and I'm breaking that into six topics, and I'll describe them when I get there. And then I'm going to talk about knowledge, and I've broken that into four topics, and I'll describe those when I get to them. And then I'm going to conclude with just one screen, on uh, what I consider to be a very important subject, very under-theorized, and that is the value of self-reflexivity. Because if you stay in school long enough to get a PhD in practice-led art, you are becoming more self-reflexive. Whether or not that means you're a better artist is a completely different question. Okay, so first of all, just to say a little bit, um, uh, real quickly, about the size of the literature. I'm just going to show about 10 screens um, to survey this question of the size of the literature. Um, this is a book that I edited, which is now in its final edition. But it began, uh, as you can see in number one there, it began uh, a long time ago. It was one of the first, or the first um, uh, publications on the practice-led PhD. It was published by a small artist group in Ireland. Um, and I'm going to come back to the second of those, um, and the third of those uh, later. Um, this book has uh, still some things in it. It has a new edition. It has some things in it that I think are valuable, and I just want to underline a couple. Judith Mottram is um, probably the authority on the st statistics of the growth of the UK PhD. She knows the number of students in every field, in every year, in every institution. Uh, she has a lot of spreadsheets, but this is a good place to go for that kind of introductory information. Um, and in case you don't know, George Smith is an interesting outlier, statistically speaking, an unusual uh, program that he runs. Because it is the only practice-led PhD in the world in which the students are not invited to bring their work in, uh, and uh, it is theory only. And George, he's a nice person, and I don't, I don't want to criticize the whole program, but I don't understand how he knows what theory every student should know before he meets the student and without seeing the artwork. But this is one of the radical possibilities of this new, these new sorts of initiatives. And then I just um, want to underline here a few people that, that I'm going to re uh, return to later in the talk. Um, Ian Biggs, um, Hank Slager, I'll have some things to say about him. Jonathan Dronsfield on my very last screen about self-reflexivity um, when I get there. Um, so these people, are, are gonna, names are gonna come up later in the talk. And I also want to show briefly the last half of this book that I edited is examples of the PhD uh, theses written around the world. And just to underline two things here about Tokyo Gedai. Uh, I think it's very uh, little known uh, in Europe and North America that Japan had the, the practice-led PhD as long as the UK. Japan has 27 art universities that grant the PhD. They have an entirely separate culture of the, of the practice-led um, art degree. Um, they have a lot of, um, these are small programs obviously, but they have a lot of diversity and it's a very interesting scene. It's led by Tokyo Gedai uh, and they have, their documents are largely online. Okay, so to continue this, oh yeah, and I can't resist saying that this book of mine has cartoons in it uh, that were done by an MA student because the field is so boring <laughs> that it's important, it's important to have at least a little bit of visual material. So Sean Belcher is the cartoonist who did this. 
So just to give a general sense of the size of this literature, there are publications like Art School Propositions for the 21st Century, which are written from outside of the world of administration and bureaucracy, written by working artists, as you can see, um, directors and so. But most of the literature is not like that. Most of the literature is uh, very bureaucratic, and I'll get to it in a second. Um, this is uh, another um, book that I wrote, which is about art critics, uh, art critiques, and I want to make a point in, in passing here uh, that the, this book had to be revised because the higher level practice-led art education involves a completely different kind of conversation between teacher and student. It is not the same as the critique that art students will have had from their first years in the bachelor's university art academy up through their master's or MFA. It's a different kind of conversation. And this, this higher level conversation is uh, suffused with, it's permeated by the administrative literature that I'm gonna be talking about. So we had to write a, had to write a separate section of that book. Um, so there are online journals like this one, the Journal of Artistic Research, a couple of my uh, ex-students um, started. And here's a little sampling of um, some of the books. The vast majority of this literature is written by people who identify themselves as art educators uh, and administrators. Um, those are the ones producing most of this kind of um, literature. Hank Slager, who I'll come back to uh, several times later in this talk, uh, is very prolific. And here's a book of his that I'll be mentioning later. Um, and his own uh, journal that he edits called the Makuzine, the MA magazine, Makuzine. Um, he works in Utrecht. Um, and another selection. On the left is the largest book so far that's been written on this subject. Um, it's, a, it's a big, heavy <laughs> book, and I'm going to be showing some uh, of the essays in it uh, later on. And on the right, one of the most widely consulted, a special issue of uh, Text at Sorkunst that's widely read. Um, so this selection, I could go on and on. Uh, a lot of these publishers are based in the UK, but a lot of the literature comes out of Scandinavia and Northern Europe and the, and, and the Netherlands, um, and increasing also in North America. That's an I.B. Taurus book on the left, that's a Sage book in the middle. The whole publishing industry is interesting as well, but don't have time to go into that. Um, and then there's the entire world of design research, because design have had the PhD for a long time, and they have their own culture of it. Um, and I'm going to be quoting later uh, by um, some pieces that Ilpo Koskinen, uh, who's the editor of this book uh, that he wrote uh, for the school in, um, in Helsinki. Okay. So, oh yeah, one more person, um, Hank Borgdorf, who I'm gonna be returning to. This is maybe the most interesting recent book just in the last couple of years, the one on the right on this subject, and I'll come back to him as well. And Intellectual Birdhouse, I have two more screens of these to show. Okay, so I'm gonna make a very simple point about this. Uh, the point is that the literature, I think, is now too large for any one person to read. I've been trying to keep up on it, I still do try, but in my opinion, 2011 was the last year when it was possible for a single human being to read all the literature on this subject. Um, and, and that may seem like a, a trivial thing, but I think it's actually a very important thing because it means this is not really a subject anymore. Uh, and it also means that there are now regional and national variants of the practice led, the idea of practice led research in different parts of the world because people are starting to read different literatures. Um, there is a little bit of writing that's been done on this, and this publication has an essay in it, several essays, one of mine and a couple of others, um, which address this question. It's becoming visible as a question. At the same time, though, the SHARE network, uh, who, uh, who put this publication out, um, are trying hard to reach out to East Asia and Southeast Asia, and so at the same time, there's an internationalism about this subject. But this is all I want to signal in this first part of the talk. I just want to say that there is no such thing anymore as an expert on this field. The field has, has become monstrous. Okay, so on to research. I'm going to divide this into um, six different um, subjects. Um, first of all, that I want to make the point that uh, research as a term, as a concept, is a starting point in most programs around the world. Um, and um, as you've already heard, I'm 
very skeptical about this idea of research and also at the same time pessimistic about the idea of changing it, but the, the Black Mountain paradigm, that is to say, um, escape with no budget um, <laughs> and, and start your own school is always available. And um, all of the <laughs> non-accredited institutions that are currently um, you know, springing up everywhere are, are you know, full of potential in this regard. Um, and then I'm going to say a little bit about the UK debates about uh, research into art because there are some confusing and overlapping possibilities um, having to do with the way that that's understood. Um, and then one screen or two on alternatives to the word research. Um, this is one of the things I end up doing often is going around to um, these programs that are starting up and, uh, and as consultant or as an advisor and um, I always suggest that there are words other than research that can be used in many situations and it's not necessary to put research into all the literature for every student. Um, doesn't usually help but I always I try anyway. Um, then the question about scientific research. How close to scientific research should art research be? How close can it be? How close is it already? Um, and a, a deeper question that often follows from that one is uh, whether or not artistic research should be defined or it should be counted as an undefinable term or as a given as an undefined term. Should it be a placeholder for what happens or should it be something that you start out by uh, trying to uh, frame? Um, and then last, a couple of screens um, on how research is assessed, because that's the growth industry um, throughout the EU, thanks to the Bologna Accords, thanks to Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and this is what's spreading around the world. Okay, so on to these six uh, topics. So first, just to make this general point about uh, research being ubiquitous, um, it's universally a starting point in programs, not just in the arts. So my screen here is uh, from a meeting of um, Austrian universities, not just in the arts, but in every subject. And you can see from the quotation at the bottom, that's a very typical, that's a very typical formulation, that the core um, component of doctoral training in all fields is advancement of knowledge through original research. Um, and some universities like Harvard say significant original research, but it's usually just original research or just research. So the two words, research and knowledge, are already in place uh, in university uh, administrative literature, and that's one of the simple reasons, a practical reason, why they so often appear in, um, in, uh, in practice-led research programs. Um, so in the, in the studio art PhD field, a number of institutions uh, try to address this question of research um, by proposing or by requiring um, courses. So here's University of Reading, which, has, which is one of these that has um, uh, classes that are required. There's a number of uh, examples. This is the, um, what is this, the CSA? Yeah, the GSA, and also does this. And I have underlined down there, research degree students attend a one-year training program in order to uh, equip them with, the, with high-level research skills. It's a typical, um, typical thing, Glasgow School of Art. Um, and then I have one other example of this, and that's the Royal College of Art, which also has um, uh, methodology courses. In this case, they're more practical. They're aimed toward uh, the viability of their graduates to develop transferable career skills. So there's a number of different forms of these, but this is a new pedagogic, um, it's a new pedagogic structure, which you can find in a number of institutions that's designed to try to familiarize the students and the faculty with what, with what it means to consider art as research that produces knowledge. And there's, I've underlined that, to prepare them for research at a higher level um, is the point of that particular program. Um, so many of these publications that I'll be looking at start out by assuming that research is central, uh, and that includes Hank Slogger's very interesting book that I'll have more to say on uh, in a few minutes. Even at the very beginning of this literature, research was presupposed. And you're looking here at a uh, original prospectus from a Microsoft Word document, um, the prospectus for one of the first books on this subject, Thinking Through Art. Um, and the, um, uh, the two editors, Katie McLeod and, and Lynn Holdridge, say at the beginning, um, it continues to prove difficult for artists both to produce art which can be identified as research and research which can be identified as art. 
So notice in the grammar of that sentence is the presupposition that this is a question of legitimation and articulation and not, a, not an originary question of, uh, that would be uh, a question of doubt or a uh, preliminary question of that sort. In this book, which is the, the largest one um, to date, there are several interesting articles on this point. There's a foreword to the entire um, a book by Hans-Peter Schwarz, um, and he makes the same kind of point. He says, it does seem to be high time to stop doubting whether art-based research exists at all and accept that it has long ago become an everyday occurrence in most art universities. So I don't doubt that this is true. It is true. Um, and I also um, um, not, wouldn't want to try to you know, just proselytize against it because it's part of the culture and texture of the contemporary pedagogy. But that doesn't mean that, that, it's, time, that it's necessary to stop questioning um, at the most fundamental level about the idea of um, that all art, all um, art that's done at this level, should be thought of as research. So my second point about research has to do with these debates that started in the UK about research through art. Um, that's Sir Christopher Frayling, who's the, one of the ones who um, who uh, first articulated these ideas. And I think here I have to pop out of my presentation a couple of times in order to get this going. So I have a little um, uh, spreadsheet, of course, because that's inevitable in this field. Um, in order to make sense of the prepositions that are used to articulate this in English, and uh, this is the original literature, so it's interesting to, to ponder it in this form. So down the left column, you have research to art, through art, into art, for art. Um, and when I was looking at these texts, I noticed that nobody has done much with research in art, so I just put it in at the bottom. <laughs> so that one's free, that can be taken. Um, <laughs> So Chris, uh, Fra Chris Frayling um, has, uh, took as his starting point um, an earlier text by Herbert Reed I have there in the second column. And uh, Reed had uh, used the expression research to art, um, which as you could see had a, a meaning for him about techniques and materials not really pertinent to what we're going to be talking about. The three um, categories that Frayling uses, through art, into art, and for art, are, are differently pertinent. Um, so the second one, through art, and, the, and this next to the bottom one, for art, I'm gonna show again on the next screen. The middle one, into art, is not problematic, as far as I know, not, is not the focus of any uh, discussions, because for him it just means art history. If you research the Mona Lisa, then you're researching through art in Frayling's way of thinking of things. Um, but, but if you look at the other two, I think uh, they show the complexity of this um, pretty well. So the form of research through art, this is the same quotation as the last screen, according to Frayling, is research in the field of art and design, for example, MPhils and PhDs that investigate technologies. And he calls this uppercase research, systematic disciplinary inquiry. And he's not primarily interested in this. It's not the focus of his interest. His interest in his original essay and since then has been research for art. Um, and here I take apart the quotation from the last screen into three different rows here. So the first part of what he said was that research leads to the production of art. This would be relatively unproblematic, but if that was all there was to research for art, then research for art would be the, more or less the same as research through art. So that, that particular line, um, research, that that line is not the most important one. The more important ones are the two bottom ones. Research that leads to art embodies the research, he says. And this is the central problematic possibility that I'll come back to in a minute and also when I talk about knowledge. Um, and that word embodies is crucial to whatever sense is gonna be made of this claim that knowledge is somehow enacted, embodied, um, but existing in various forms in or as art. And then at the bottom, to finish the quotation, he says, he calls this lowercase research or searching, which implies that it's free of the strict research methodologies that he associates with sciences and also some social sciences. But of course it leaves it open, and he does this intentionally. This is, uh, I'm not critiquing him here. He leaves it open um, how you might think of that kind of lowercase um, research. And so the last time, I think this, I think only these three screens malfunction, I hope, <laughs> finished with the malfunctions. So just to show you how complicated this kind of thing has become in the hands of art educators, here's a book by Graham Sullivan. Uh, and I'm not gonna read this screen, but you'll see what goes on here. He tries to combine prepositions. 
So Graeme Sullivan's book uh, has research in and about art, or in and with art, or in and through art. And I, I personally can't remember these. I have to keep consulting the, the so I'm not gonna read them. But I just wanna show you that this is when, when, art, when the language of art education gets a hold of this kind of material, it can divide and subdivide and subdivide. And, and there are a lot of graphs and charts also in Sullivan's book. Um, there are moments where these kind of uh, things make sense, but as I'm sure many of you know, the big danger in today's administrative climate is giving a chart like this to an administrator who's interested in qualitative assessment because they will give you back a chart that's 10 times longer and has prepositions you've never used. Okay, so third topic under research is some alternatives to research. And by the way, these uh, screen, I just put pictures in the background of my screens because I don't like to look at gray or white screens all the time. And sometimes they are pertinent and sometimes they're not. These are not pertinent. <laughs> <laughs> so just one screen on some alternatives to research. These are words that are sometimes useful, even in administration, as a way of thinking around or through or past um, the idea of research. First of all, there's inquiry or investigation. That's different, uh, has an investigation in particular, very different nuance in, in Portuguese and other languages, but in English, inquiry has some advantages. It has the advantage of affinity with, um, well, the journal critical inquiry or the idea of criticality, a very crucial, indispensable idea, you would think, without which a program really shouldn't go forward, but uh, they often do. So inquiry or, and or investigation would be one possibility to avoid the idea of research. Project is, of course, widely used um, as part of many artists' self-definitions. Part of the rhetoric of the art world works very well in that, uh, in that context, has its, also has its critics. Practice, the same sort of thing. There are critics of, the, of all of these, and uh, there's an interesting little essay by Paul Chan um, against uh, Project, and Thierry Dedouve, the Belgian art historian, has written against practice. And, there are things to be said, pro and con, in each of these, but um, they're, they're quite common, and so is the last one, work, uh, which, is a, which is a common default term and or placeholder. So in certain circumstances, it seems to me very useful to try to think of how to form administratively viable sentences that do not involve the word research by taking these or other terms. The fourth subject under research I wanted to talk about was about um, science, scientific research. Um, it's a very widely debated subject. Um, and for the purposes of just this talk, I'm going to divide it into three possibilities. Um, and I am numbering these 4A, 4B, 4C, because I'm going to come back to them in a minute. So first of all, artistic research can utilize scientific research protocols, methodologies, and forms. So the standard parts of a scientific paper form, methods, materials, results. Um, can be used, even though artistic research is fundamentally distinct from scientific research. Or artistic research would need to rethink these things. Or it cannot use them because it's fundamentally different. So you notice that the, the, third, the last line of each one of these threes is more or less the same because it's generally agreed that, that whatever happens in art pedagogy is, should be, necessarily must always be different from science, but that leads to different conclusions about the relation between um, artistic research and scientific research. So I'll give you some examples of those. This is from the, the Routledge uh, Guide to Research again, an essay by Michael Biggs, who I've uh, shown on the screen a little bit, a bit ago. So they do, this, uh, they do a Venn diagram um, showing hybrid models uh, merging, the, merging science and art. And so 4A and more 4C would be like this, and 4A and B would be these two. So you can see sometimes that science is posited as a thing from which you can escape. And, and other times it's posited as a thing from, that you're stuck with forever. The 4B, the, the middle of the three options, is the vaguest one, and for some people, the richest one. Um, so we'll give you an example of that. Um, this is, um, well, I'll just read the middle paragraph. Artistic research is not explicitly scientific, but it is, quote, a form of knowledge in its own right, an amphibian discipline in a littoral landscape, occupying or traversing the liminal space between plural disciplinary formations discursively constituted. <laughs> so needless to say, we all, know about, <laughs> we all know about international art English and <laughs> ways of writing. This is where international art English collides with administrative <laughs> English and produces this kind of thing. So 
it, it's not that a sentence like this is necessarily evil. It's that from an administrator's point of view, it has to be disentangled. You have to work on this in order to see what kind of hybridity is being proposed. Um, here from a more prominent, uh, 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 prominent, in a prominent text by Helga Nwatli is that same sort of thing. Um, she says, there's an interest in the subject and the aims of art research from, as it were, first principles. So the arts don't repeat existing research methods, but they have something to do with them. Um, and an example of the third of the options um, that artistic research cannot use scientific research um, um, uh, methods would be this, and the quotation in the middle paragraph is, there is no scientific research to which artistic research might have to comply. Artistic research should be left alone <laughs> to develop its own methods. In some of this rhetoric, you can hear the administrators looking, talking to the deans and other faculties, you know, please leave us alone. And, and, in, and in other documents, you can hear the reverse. You can hear them saying, please, to the scientists, please come and talk to me. <laughs> right? So it's, there's, there's a, a collision of, um, of ambitions often in this literature. Um, the fifth question, the one this often leads to, is whether art research should be defined at all. And here again, I'm just going to give these letters because I'm going to come back to them in one screen. So one common answer is, yes, art research should be defined because that's the only way to have conversations across an entire university. Um, and in many institutions, that's very important. In an art university, uh, not so much in an academy, obviously, but in a university often is important. Or you could say no, because art research has an intrinsic openness which is either the result of its visual nature or of its institutional position, and that that would be the position to, um, to nourish. An example of the first of these um, is Schwartz, who says, a uniform, quote, research infrastructure has to be developed so that practice-based research can be carried out in accordance with fixed methodological guidelines. That would maybe not be a majority opinion, but another example of the same would be this where the, the quotation in the middle is, the basic requirement for any research is that it has a clear objective and approach, never mind its, its relation to other forms of research. But an example of B, that you cannot define artistic research, uh, would be this, which I took from the school, the Visual Arts uh, website for PhDs, and they say research in art is characterized by interaction with artistic practice. It's an inseparable part of the work of the artist. Oh, sorry, let me go back to that for a second. It's an inseparable part of the work of the artist with research in art, as opposed to research about art. There is no set goal or expected result. So that's more along the lines of the second of those two. And then in the Routledge Guide, uh, I'll give you another example. Um, they advocate for finding a new model that's not scientific slash academic or creative. And this leads me into the more interesting, I think, um, um, and more complicated um, in-between uh, positions. So they say, um, these authors say, we suggest there cannot be a single research model that satisfies both academic and practitioners. Um, they suggest a third and distinct community that's the offspring of the two parent communities. Um, but they also, like, like a number of authors, um, they, they propose this and posit it, but it's not actually here at this point intersecting with the administrative literature. An administrator would immediately say, well, exactly how is, are you going to be distinct? Um, and here from the same, a little bit farther in the same essay, um, one, one disadvantage of the hybrid approach is that there may be criteria in the academic world that are incompatible. So they say maybe, but they're not, um, but they're not specifying it. And then down at the bottom, we do not think this classification of criteria has yet been undertaken, and they don't, because they leave it to the administrators. I just think it's very a treacherous, it's a dangerous thing to leave this kind of work to your administrators. Um, it's the kind of thing that needs to be done in-house. So the reason I was numbering these is because I wanted to point to what I think is the common configuration of, of these problems. It's 4C plus 5B. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's administrative thinking, right? <laughs> So 4C is that artistic research cannot use scientific um, research protocols, and that becomes often combined with 5B, that artistic research cannot be defined because it has an intrinsic openness. And now I'm going to show you a couple of screens from Henk Slager's book, which I think is one of the most interesting um, along these lines. So um, he defines doctoral research in the arts as temporary autonomous research. He says it has no need to be led by the formatted models of the established scientific order. And I'll read that uh, middle paragraph. 
this will be a form of research not swayed by issues dictated by the late capitalist free market system or its knowledge commodification. This will be an authentic research that comes about through artistic necessity. He has um, an idea that, um, that artistic research could be called a delta science. So in that second paragraph, he says, um, many artistic research projects seem to thwart the well-defined disciplines. They know the hermeneutic questions of the humanities, the alpha sciences. They are engaged in the empirically scientific methods, the beta scientific methods, the beta sciences, and they're aware of commitment, the gamma sciences, but they point to a delta science which is characterized by the capacity to continuously engage in novel, unexpected epistemological relations. And he's very interested in the, he's, he's activist in this sense, he's interested in, in outlying, um, outlying um, institutions and flexible constructions, multiplicities, and new reflective zones. These are, of course, this is like catnip to an administrator, these, these terms, right? I haven't talked to him about this, but I just, I'm going to wait until I find an example of an institution that's taken these things and made them into spreadsheets that every student and teacher has to follow, and then I might tell, talk to him about that. Uh, so the last of the subjects and that I want to talk about here was about how research is assessed, and this is an enormous subject, as some of you know. It's, uh, it's not encompassable in a single um, lecture, but I just want to make a few um, simple points about it. Um, usually, the literature just stresses that the PhD dissertation written by the artist at the, for their PhD thesis needs to be up to research standards, but there are uh, increasingly programs that try to specify that. There's a whole range from programs that have just a few lines of official literature. Um, a couple years ago, I visited uh, Dundee in Scotland, and they have just like three or four lines that they use to, to, to shape their PhD uh, theses. But then, on the other hand, it can, it can ramify. And my example of an elaborate version of this from the design world um, is the Alto University School um, of Art, Design, and Architecture which has some amazing documents produced by Ilpo Koskinen, whose name came up um, about 10 minutes ago. And he has, or had on their website, I haven't checked and see if this is still up, a very entertaining five or eight page long description to prospective students of how to propose their work as research. So he says, this site gives some tips for people to consider applying to our doctoral program. About page three, you get to this. Under data and methods, you have three different choices. The first one is hypothetical deductive research. He says, if you realize when reading this page you do not know what I'm talking about, you have some learning to do. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and then the second uh, option is interpretive research. Um, don't be fooled, he says. If this sounds like an easy alternative, it's not. <laughs> and the third one, the third of your options as, an, as a student applicant is constructive research. Um, and it's the same uh, sort of things here. Um, Constructive research is more than welcomed unless you make ridiculous claims about novelty when in fact design researchers have invented very, very few new things. <laughs> now, I really love this text. I hope they still use it, but I'm just using this to signal in a very condensed way that there is a very elaborate research um, uh, set of research protocols available that started in the design community that's currently being imported um, into the um, visual art uh, practice community. So just a conclusion about this question of research. Um, at the moment, um, the Bologna Accords are just the tip of the iceberg because um, the EU is importing UK models of quantitative assessment. Um, if any of you don't know what the H index is, you should Google it, you'll be very depressed. <laughs> it's the, the H index is a way of re reducing your entire life's work to a number, a single number. Now, there's a lot of literature on it. There's a brilliant essay by someone, uh, someone at Goldsmiths, uh, whose name I forget, called Living with the H Index. I can't think who it is, but anyway, there's a, there's a great literature on this subject if you want to learn about it. Um, and I have been, I've learned last year that um, there are at least two national initiatives to export the UK REF model and quantitative assessment, um, one to France, one to Germany. There's a consortium of universities that are, that are involved in this at the moment. So if you think it's bad now, it's getting worse. And North America, we're doing the same sort of thing in a, more, in a more ignorant way because most of our administrators don't know what's happening on the side of the Atlantic. They just copy from Google. <laughs> So I think my, my, my moral here is that it's necessary to manage two often incompatible goals. Uh, one of them is keeping the assessment of arts open, flexible, and non-institutional. 
for all the obvious reasons. Uh, but the other one is specifying with precision when it's possible, because um, I don't believe within existing institutional structures that it is possible to escape this. You have to start a black mountain to completely escape it. You have to work with it if you don't start your own black mountain. And then just to conclude a little, uh, one screen about research as a whole, I think my feeling about the literature as much as that I've been able to read is that its purpose now is increasingly going in the direction that I was epitomizing with Hank Slager, although I could have chosen other people. That is that the literature is produced uh, not by the higher level administrators, but by the chairs and, and uh, the people in departments, is to assert political and institutional freedom um, and self-contradictions and omissions in this literature, like some of the complicated sentences, are tactical. That is to say, this literature can be read as, as, a, um, as a rhetorical, as a rhetorical uh, gesture or an activism. Um, and therefore, the, 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 the critical mass of this literature is increasingly at odds with the um, quantification um, that's often being imposed on it. Okay, I have left us less to say about knowledge, but these two words always go together as far as I, I know. Um, my screen's here, by the way. This is the, the University of Coimbra, um, which I visited a couple years ago. Um, and uh, that's the bell tower um, uh, known as the bitch <laughs> because it calls it, the people, students have been calling people for centuries to their classes, so they call it the bitch. That's what's on the screen. So four topics about knowledge. Um, first of all, uh, very briefly, six theories of knowledge because knowledge has actually been studied um, outside of the arts, obviously, for a long time, and there is a great literature that can be drawn upon. Um, second, um, some notes about the way that knowledge is not well defined in the context of visual art. Um, third, the question of how knowledge is related to the work of art, as in the idea of embodiment and so on. And then alternatives, as I did before, to avoid the word knowledge. So just on two screens now, six theories of knowledge that are available for, uh, for use, for adoption. At least three of these are implicit in art world discourse often already. So first of all, there's tacit knowledge. That's uh, Michael Polanyi on the screen there, a historian of science, philosopher of science. Um, so tacit knowledge, of course, is things you don't quite know yet. Um, but you may be able to describe in future. There, they are, it's possible to bring them into language. There's visual knowledge. Of course, if visual art is going to be a separate uh, kind of uh, a subject, then it, there might be a kind of knowledge that has to be called visual knowledge. And there's affective knowledge, which is everybody's favorite theory these days in many different fields in music, anthropology, art, and so on. Um, if visual art is concerned with feelings and emotions and affect, um, then certainly its form of knowledge could also or should also be thought of as affective. And there are, of course, literatures on these. Um, there are at least three other ideas in play in the in, in uh, philosophy of knowledge. A, a logician, a, st a person who studies logic, would say that uh, my next uh, entry here, propositional knowledge, is the only kind of knowledge you can have, because logic, logical propositions are the only available form of knowledge. Everything else is quasi nonsense or nonsense. So there is a, a there's a there's a core to this in terms of logic. Then there's also practical knowledge, which is something that you know how to do, but you will probably never be able to put in words. It's not tacit, because you may not be able to articulate it. So playing a musical instrument, riding a bicycle, things like that would be examples. You just have to show, practice, do it yourself. And then there's phenomenal knowledge, phenomenological knowledge, intensive, lived, immersive experiences, climbing a mountain and so on, um, which are uh, somehow, it seems synesthetic to use that, you know, the common way of thinking about um, things you've experienced, they have an intensity in memory, but they're also not transmissible. So you see, even with this list, that these can, form, can perform different functions. It's a way of thinking about avoiding the single word, uh, a knowledge. Um, then I wanted to say a little bit about how knowledge is not well defined in the visual arts, and I'm going to take as my example um, this text of Hank Borgdorf, which is from that book, The Routledge Companion. Um, there's the text at the bottom of the screen, which I'll repeat on the next screen. Um, research em researchers employ experimental and hermeneutic methods that reveal and articulate the tacit knowledge that is situated and embodied in specific artworks and artistic processes. So I just repeat that here, and I'll just make a couple of comments about that. Experimental and hermeneutic are, are famously opposed or opposable. They're quite different, um, uh, I'd say fundamentally different there. 
Tacit knowledge is widely debated and uh, famously ill-defined even for philosophers of science, and I'll say a bit more about that in the next screen. But I want to make a special point of the last of these. The, when he says situated and embodied, I think that avoids or leads a very crucial distinction between theories of how knowledge inheres in visual objects. Either the object, either the knowledge is the visual object or the knowledge is embodied by it and has to be extracted from it. And I'll come back to that in a second. But first, uh, one screen about tacit knowledge. It's widely debated even in the art world and my own favorite source is my colleague, Frances Whitehead, who's an, an environmental artist um, and she started this thing called Knowledge Lab. She has a very um, well-developed, well-articulated theory of what counts for her as tacit knowledge. So there are theorists in the art world who are working on the idea of taking tacit knowledge as their principal uh, form. But I wanted to say more about that third and I think really fundamental um, question. How is knowledge exactly related to the artwork itself? Again, schematically, you have two fundamental choices. First of all, knowledge inheres in the visual object, so the object itself is a form of knowledge. And second, knowledge is interpreted to exist in the object. So the discourse reveals the object's contribution to knowledge. Obviously, in the art world, it's usually a combination of these two, but they're philosophically very divergent ideas. Um, if the first one were exclusively the case, then a PhD student in a practice-led program would not have to write a dissertation, and they would not need the help of their advisors to extract the articulable knowledge from their works. On the other hand, if the second option were to be the focus of a PhD program, um, then the student would produce the work of visual art, and the knowledge would be extracted from it, and the work would become useless you wouldn't need it anymore because you would have extracted the knowledge from it. So you can see how these two, I think, go in very different directions. It's a question of keeping them related. Okay, I'm going to skip my quote there. Just to show you there are many different forms of these, uh, forms of these claims. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip that one and read this last one here also by Hank Borgdorf. So he defines artistic research as the articulation of the unreflective non-conceptual content enclosed in aesthetic experiences, enacted in creative processes, and embodied in artistic products. So if you think of this idea of knowledge as something that has to be pulled out of its, um, out of its matrix, then the idea that it's enclosed in the matrix or embodied in the matrix is a, is a code or a shorthand for the idea that the purpose of higher education in the arts is to help articulate, to extract that information or knowledge from it. That would be part of that or consonant with that second um, interpretation. And I'm gonna skip this one as well. There are many, this is from the, the, um, the program at Leiden, the part I underlined there is that where they say, that you, the meaning of your artwork is not easily put into words, but with work, it can be put into words. Okay, the last thing I wanna say about knowledge is just this, and that there are different alternatives which could be used instead of the word knowledge and instead of qualifying it. There's Wilhelm Dilthey, is a very well-articulated distinction that's been available for a century now between understanding and, and, and knowledge in English. Um, and there's expression, as in the English philosopher Collingwood, uh, where expression has to do with consciousness and individuation. And there's meaning, as in uh, Gottfried Berm's explorations of what he calls iconic logos. These are all problematic, obviously, in different ways. Um, so is the idea of iconic difference. It's, it's, a, it's an attempt on Berm's part to try to say something about the kind of meaning that inheres in visual art without actually um, saying that it's the same as the meaning in, in the rest of language. These are three very interesting, very complex ideas, and two of them at least have a pretty long history that could be used instead of knowledge. So just to conclude about this, um, I think that there is this crucial equivocation in many programs. It can be an enabling equivocation, but it is an equivocation between the idea that art might be knowledge, that the visual art, the visual is knowledge, and the idea that the visual produces knowledge. The visual arts PhD could be, and in some cases is, an opportunity to rethink that. So as I said, one screen to conclude about self-reflexivity. Um, so I have a picture of Jonathan Dronsfield. He teaches at University of Reading, and, and he said, uh, he hasn't seen this lecture, but he actually often looks this way, very despondent. Um, he was at an event that I did called What Do Artists Know? He was very unhappy with most of what we were saying. Um, so he has, um, 
he has an idea about this that corresponds closely with my own concerns. The notion is that if you start as a young artist and you stay in school and you continue up through the MA or MFA up to the PhD, you are necessarily becoming more and more aware of your practice. You're necessarily articulating it better and better to yourself and to others. And that is written into the rubrics and capstone achievements and assessment criteria of many institutions. Articulate your work, be clear, all the rest of that. Many, many, in many ways, this idea of self-reflexivity uh, is written into the, to the uh, requirements of programs. But it leaves, it begs a very important question, and that is, it makes the assumption that the PhD takes you to an optimal level of self-reflection, which for, for the production of interesting, good, new art, however you want to qualify that, seems to me to be very problematic because the, the history of art is absolutely full of artists who couldn't talk about their work at all. And no matter how much you paid them, <laughs> they wouldn't be able to say what in the world they're thinking. And so the correlation is, is dubious. And then, since we're all, you know, good post-structuralists for several generations now, it should be very problematic to every teacher and administrator that a, a more uh, acute self-reflexivity creates a better art. Uh, and yet that's the tacit assumption that's built into these programs. None of them that I know have figured out a way to make an artist less reflective as they go along through and get their doctorate. So that's the very pessimistic point that I want to end on. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>